Let's get to our special segment, Coronavirus Facts versus Fears, where we answer your questions. We're joined by family physician Dr. Jennifer Kwan and infectious disease specialist Dr. Zane Shagla to, talk, to answer those questions today. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. A lot of people are talking, of course, about masks now that it's officially being recommended that we wear them when we can't keep our distance from people. So, Dr. Kwan, let me start with you. Where exactly would you recommend people wear a mask? There's a very simple acronym that you can use to remember when to wear your mask. So it is ACT. Um, all indoor public spaces. C is for crowds, so anywhere where you cannot distance two meters away from other people. And T is for transit, including uh, public transportation. Okay, uh, Dr. Chakla, would you agree any sort of indoor space? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the principles being, and as Dr. Kwan had mentioned, those environments where that distancing is very compromised and the indoor spaces where ventilation is inappropriate and, and the transit where, where you know, with, Unfortunately, cars and vehicles, it, maintaining a meter and a half isn't isn't perfect. So, so I agree. Those are those are the areas that you really want to consider it. Um, and and um, you know, if you have a lot of space and your own, you're outdoors and by yourself, then that's maybe not the area to consider it. The thing is, I'm seeing a lot more people, as you say, outdoors, just walking around, but wearing masks. And maybe some of them are, are on transit, and that's why they're doing it. But I think a lot of people feel afraid that if they're walking on the sidewalk and somebody else is approaching on the sidewalk. Somebody might not step out of the way and they might pass too close. Uh, Dr. Kwan, would you suggest people wear a mask in those circumstances or is it really not necessary? I, th I think that there could be an option for you to carry around a cloth mask in your pocket, like a clean one, so that if that situation arises, you can pull it out and use it immediately. That being said, um, if you choose to be extra cautious, you are worried that you may encounter people on the sidewalk or path, then you can wear a mask as long as you're still following um, the recommendations of proper uh, putting it on and proper removal. Okay, so Dr. Chakala, let's take a look at that. What is the best way to put on and to take off your mask? And what do you need to know when it's on your face? So, uh, yeah, so step one, uh, and I'll show you my mask here. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the big step here is to try not to contaminate your hands while putting on the mask and vice versa. Uh, try not to contaminate when you're putting, taking off the mask, not getting your hands contaminated. So step one before anything is washing your hands before you use the mask so that the stuff on your hands doesn't end up on the mask. Um, if you have glasses, it's time to take them off now. You want to handle the mask by the loops if this is the, the type of mask, which is the typical cloth masks and non medical masks that you have. Um, again, handle it by the loops alone, avoiding the pleated sheet because that's the area that's contaminated. You then want to put them on the ears. Uh, and you can see that uh, right at the bridge of the nose, there's this piece to adjust. And again, you want it comfortable on your nose. You want to adjust it. And you will really want it comfortable there. You want to get it under the chin, too, so you have that nice seal so that your nose and mouth are, are, are covered up. Uh, you again want to just make sure that it's not slipping down, not uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's in a position that you could carry it or, or leave it on for, for a few minutes or a few hours, depending on how long you need it, that's not obstructing your vision, that you're not fidgeting with it. And then you can put on your glasses afterwards, check that you have a good seal and that your glasses aren't fogging up in, in that sense. And you want to wash your hands after that, too, because if anything was on the mask, it'll end up on your hands at that point. And again, you want a clean slate after this. Got it. And then similarly, when you're taking it off, again, lean, washing your hands first so, so you don't contaminate your mask. Lean a bit forward, handling it by the loops again, pushing it forward so it doesn't really contaminate the face. And then depending on where you want to store it, in a pocket or in a bag, um, holding it up to, to whatever that surface is. If you really do need to handle the mask to manipulate it really at the edges of that pleated sheet, putting it together or folding it, and then putting it away after that, and then washing your hands after that too. But the biggest thing that people get into trouble with is touching their mask, either with putting it on, taking it off, or while it's on their face, trying to adjust it. And all of a sudden, everything that's on your mask is now on your hands, and you created another contaminated surface. Got it. Okay, Dr. Kwan, let's uh, get back to some basics about wearing the mask because viewers have these questions. Uh, who benefits from wearing a mask, the wearer or those around them? 
The messaging around mask has been that my mask protects you and yours protects me because it catches the droplets from the wearer's mouth and prevents them from, uh, you know, moistly going around to everybody else. Um, however, there is some um, likelihood that the mask may protect the wearer. The reason that people are so hesitant to say that it truly does is because that really depends on the type of mask you're wearing, um, what fabric it's made of, whether it's being worn properly. So um, yes, masks do protect other people. They may also protect you. Okay, so Dr. Chagla, the next question is, why should I wear a mask if I'm not sick? And we have, we think now, the answer to that question. Yeah, and again, I think it's been clearly stated. Unfortunately, people do shed the virus either immediately before they become sick in the, the 48 hours beforehand, or there are people that shed the virus asymptomatically. And so that mask is an extra level of protection uh, to say that you're, you're, you're protecting your respiratory droplets while going into those closed spaces uh, in those, those areas and times where you may be pre-symptomatic and then you, you can't take a time machine and go back to that point. So it's, it's what you can do to, today to protect for that, that opportunity. Okay, Dr. Kwan, let me pick up on your last answer. You were talking about different masks being uh, different as far as whether or not it protects you or protects uh, the people around you. Let me ask what's the difference, and this is a viewer question, between a good mask or a bad mask? And, and could you just sort of break down what a mask should be made out of uh, in an effort for you, first of all, not to spread the virus? Um, so there's two main categories of masks. There's medical grade masks and non-medical grade masks, which are the cloth or homemade masks. For the general public, it is the cloth or homemade masks which are recommended um, to prevent transmission to one another. So I believe that the mask has to be at least uh, two layers and if possible, um, there, there's a space that you can insert a filter. Um, perhaps, um, he can also comment on if there's any other additional requirements. Well, filters, for example, would come from where? Um, so some recommendations are like coffee filters. Coffee filters would, would do the trick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are going to take a quick break. I'm going to ask you both to stick around. We have some more questions to answer, and we'll get to that when we come back. One of the questions coming up, UV lights, can they be used as disinfectants? We'll get into it when we come back. Welcome back to our special coronavirus facts versus fears. We're here with family physician Dr. Jennifer Kwan and infectious disease specialist Dr. Zane Shagla. With face masks now officially recommended to Canadians, Chief Public Health Officer Teresa Tam also warned against judging those who might not be able to wear the one. Those who are, for example, dealing with asthma, who are autistic, deaf and hearing impaired. Now, we did a segment on masks specifically being made for those who are deaf, and they have a clear plastic piece, a vinyl piece, over the mouth portion of the mask. Here's what the chair of the Bob Rumble Home for the Deaf had to say about them. Uh, anything that helps us to uh, level the playing field in communication, make it easier to lip read and be lip read, is a terrific innovation. And, and uh, the foundation with that kind of innovation, it, it's, a, it's a godsend for our, for our uh, members of the deaf community. So, Dr. Kwan, clearly some people should just avoid wearing a mask, I guess, because of other health concerns. Absolutely. So there definitely has to be exceptions for people with medical problems that um, can cause uh, breathing issues, uh, people with uh, disabilities, and young children. Uh, so we definitely should not you know, make assumptions about why people may not wear a mask. And it is important for um, stores or businesses when implementing mask policies to also have these uh, exceptions in place. That being said, if people are able to wear a mask, I would strongly encourage people to wear a mask because it offers some sort of protection to these other people who may be more vulnerable. Okay, Dr. Chagla, one of the other questions that comes up is how often do you need to wash the mask? If, if I use my mask today, for a couple of hours, maybe even just for one trip to the grocery store, do I need to wash it again or can I use it again tomorrow? So, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is more cleanliness is better than less cleanliness. You don't want to let your mask, you know, use it for eight hours and then get it contaminated and put it back on your face. 
if you have a brief airing, it's probably reasonable to reuse it after a couple of days and not necessarily wash it. But again, it's a good habit if you're if you're going to use it for a day, similar to the pair of clothes that you use for the day, that they both go in the washing machine and then it comes out clean afterwards. Okay. I also want to get you, Dr. Shackle, on another question about UV light, mm -hmm. because we're seeing mm -hmm. that being used as a disinfectant uh, in New York, for example, in public places. What do you think of UV light being used that way? Is it meant to be used that way? Yeah, we've we've known for a while UV light uh, as a sterilizing technique, and and there's there's commercial products and a number of other real cool innovations like robots that use UV light for sterilization, and and this was used prior to COVID. It's uh, it's been uh, uh, expanded to COVID as part of it, and certainly UV light does have a role as UV light is toxic for humans in significant amounts. It's toxic for bacteria and viruses. Um, the issue with these machines, you know, when you're trying to clean rooms or spaces is that uh, the light has to get into every little nook and cranny into those spaces. So that under furniture, the areas, um, if you're going to shine a giant light, you might not get that light to penetrate under those areas. And for things like hospitals, it has to be very, very careful that all the areas in a room get clean. So it might be a good adjunct. Um, there, there are some studies actually looking at this in Montreal. I think they have a robot that's using UV light to try to clean the rooms. Um, and certainly something that, that's easy to, to purpose and, and something we'll see a lot come out for in the future. For is sure, is, is it a common at practice at any, any of the health facilities that either of you work at? Uh, Dr. Chakla, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Dr. Kwan on that. Yeah, so we've used UV light for other reasons, for other very resistant organisms, uh, some of the antibiotic resistant organisms that we've had concerns with. We would do a deep clean and then we'd use a UV sterilizer on top as a second layer. It's not the sole intervention, but it's something to add on top and it's relatively easy to do. Dr. Kwan, what about you? I work in a community family practice, so we don't have any of these uh, high-tech machines. Although in the future, you never know, right? If this is going to be yeah. around for a while. Got it. Okay, Dr. Kwan, we're also getting a, a viewer question about gloves, because some people are choosing to wear gloves outside. Uh, they want to know if you can wash the gloves and then reuse them. Is that a possibility? That's a good question. Uh, I would say absolutely not. Uh, gloves are not meant to be reused. Uh, they're not very um, durable. If you wash them, you don't really get every, you know, germ or microbe off the glove. So definitely I would not recommend um, washing gloves. I also don't really recommend uh, wearing gloves to go to the grocery store or things like that because gloves are actually, um, so if you're using it to touch anything else, like if you're touching your groceries, uh, if you're touching the credit card machine, the glove is dirty and contaminated with everything you've touched. So um, I do see people, you know, they touch their face, they touch their phone, now everything is dirty. So it is better for people to focus not touching their face and to wash their hands uh, very routinely. I'm a big proponent for masks, but uh, I can't say the same for gloves. Okay, let's talk about another question. Dr. Chakla, uh, this one comes in saying, if the virus can spread through your eyes, if it can enter your body through your eyes, should goggles be recommended as well? Yeah, I, in, in hospital settings where we're dealing with patients with a with a significant burden of COVID where they're coughing and, and there's droplets and you have to provide really close contact to those patients, it is recommended and is part of our normal PPE supplies, either as a visor or as a, a goggles. For the average person, as long as they're trying to maintain that distancing um, and they're, they're not really having that kind of close contact with people, it's not necessarily uh, uh, an intervention uh, outside of the masks. So the, the masks offer the more more protection in that, or, or the masks offer protection in that sense. Okay. Um, now, now visors could be used as an alternate for masks for people who, who can't use masks, and and it kind of gives that, as you said, that eye protection plus a bit of that face protection uh, as well. Could could visors then be used by? For example, those who have asthma, does it give you a little bit more breathing room, perhaps, than a mask mm -hmm. would? Uh, Dr. Yeah. Juan, sorry, Dr. Chuckle, go ahead. Yeah, I think, again, that's a perfect example, right? Like, uh, they, they are protecting themselves from others' droplets. Uh, they, they do offer some sort of protection from their own droplets. They're not perfect because you get flow around the mask in that sense or the visor in that sense. But it can be an alternate for, for protection, for sure. Okay. Uh, guys, I'm out of time, so I've got to leave the conversations there. But family physician Dr. Jennifer Kwan and infectious disease specialist Dr. Zane Chakla, appreciate you both stopping by uh, and sharing your advice. Thanks for that. Thanks for your time.
Take care. And to answer your COVID-19 questions, we just need you to send them, send us those questions. Here's how to reach us. Email CTV News Channel, sorry, News Channel at ctv.ca, Facebook at CTV News Channel, and then Twitter at CTV News. You're watching CTV News Channel.